Welcome to the Bishop Trilogy Podcast. We're here with Coach Rocky Moore, who is a two-time CAF Championship coach and a Hall of Famer. He is a disciple of legendary Waterloo High School basketball coach Larry Henson. He was born and raised in East St. Louis and moved to Waterloo in fifth grade. He ended up playing and graduating from Northeast Missouri State University, where he earned an honorable mention in all-conference and degree in health and physiology. Ultimately, he ended up in California in 1981, where he started coaching at Pacific Palisades, where he, gra- where he coached current Golden State coach Steve Kerr. He then coached. He then coached with Stan Morrison at USC, and eventually he became a head coach of John Muir High School in Pasadena. He won state titles in 1993 and 1996, and he was named Los Angeles City Coach of the Year in 1993. So most and most recently, Coach Rock has coached at Fishermont High School and is currently coaching with Pangos and Belmont Shore. So, Coach, can you fill in the blanks in your background? Uh, sure. I mean, you touch almost every corner of my background, but I think there was a couple pieces missing. Um, yes, I, I grew up in the streets in East St. Louis, and then I had an opportunity to uh, learn to play ball at Burger at a young age. Uh, when we had recesses, we didn't have physical education classes in the early days. So during the recess and after school, we played uh, on the you know, pickup games yeah. you know, on NAFL. So I had a lot of big brothers in East St. Louis. You know, I grew up in that culture. The piece is one thing is that I grew up in African American culture. So I went out to play ball at a very young age, but some of the bigger guys who were really, really good um, were my big brothers. And when I say big brothers, they're from, you know, uh, uh, Rock Junior, East, East St. Louis, Rock Junior High. Yeah. And then uh, East St. Louis High School, they came down to our elementary school, which is Blanco, and we played ball. So I, I was at a young age able to play with uh, bigger, stronger, and better players that made me better. Yeah. But they saw my work ethic and my desire to play the game. So they put the pieces together, and uh, I just had a you know passion for just playing. And when I had these great talent players around me, it made me better than my game. But uh, they treated me like I was one of their brothers. That's the first piece. And then um, moving from East St. Louis, one fellow elementary school, going to Waterloo, went from an African American culture to a German town, and but at Waterloo Community. Uh, High school or junior high school, or it was elementary school at that time, um, we had physical education classes. Now it's can be salad, but PE classes. And my uh, fifth grade coach, Coach Meltzer, saw me go to relays and basketball. So I love all the sports, really. I love playing you know, baseball, football, basketball, track, field, tennis, all the sports. But I had a love for basketball. And when we did the relays, you know, Coach saw me, I was pretty fast, pretty quick. Have the ball, have a rock pretty well. Mm-hmm. And he asked me to try out for the team. And I said, okay. I'd have to ask my mom to see if I could try it out. I just used that as an excuse. My mom didn't. She always supported me in whatever I wanted to do. Like your parents supported you and what you want to do that's related to basketball and playing. So it's just a natural phenomenon. Again, Coach Melcher uh, had me out. Not only made the team, but I made the starting five. And then, you know, from there, it just evolved. I got to bring up a guy by the name of Coach Bobby Brown. Mm-hmm. Coach Coach Bobby Brown, I had him from fifth grade to sixth grade. So whatever team I was on, like in fifth grade, I played on the sixth grade team. The sixth grade team, I played on the seventh grade team. And uh, when Coach Melcher transitioned to Coach Bobby Brown, I saw he, how he shot the basketball. He wanted to shoot just like him. And he said it was the top of the game. He showed with high arch and made nothing but net. And he said, sure, I'll teach you. For about three weeks, I had to shag all the shots. He taught me some discipline. It just reminded me kind of like that movie Karate Kid, one and two. Uh-huh. Wipe on, wipe off. You know, I had to go wipe off the floor, moving the ball, bring it back to the end. And finally, he saw the discipline and the thirst that I had and the desire to learn. I had him bathe my, my dues first, and then he gave me an opportunity. He taught me the rest of his history. But it was a transition going from Unorganized sports, playing in the recess playground, going to organized sports, and playing uh, within the recess or in a in a physical education class, and then yeah. I get to you know uh, act, an extracurricular activity sport team like basketball at the elementary uh, school was great. That was a great opportunity. So that's how my kind of career you know got started, and uh, it, it was, Waterloo was a sports oriented town. They really supported. Uh, 
our kids in youth sports and, and programs. And I remember, you know, it was a little, like a little arena. And our colleagues were green and white, we were called the Indians. And, and I was, uh, my dreams came true, you know, from, from that, that point on. That's it. Now, what additional pieces to my journey? Um, from uh, playing for Coach Bobby Brown, it was a great opportunity. Um, they had almost like comparable to a traveling team, but you, it depended on your height and your weight. Yeah. And I didn't get to, yeah, I didn't meet the measurement because I was tall and skinny. But I was too tall, so I didn't meet the height. I didn't meet the weight dimensions. But my look, my brother, my cousins, all my best friends made the team, and they made it all the way to like the semifinals in Illinois High School Athletic Association, the, the travel ball, and they played Bunker Hill. And that, man, I saw how they played, and I knew that I could really help them, you know? So I kept on working, my, working on my game. So Coach Bobby Brown, uh, who was my seventh and eighth grade coach, who was a lifelong friend to this day, he was actually he was my role model hero back in the time, he and, uh, invited me to go to one of the varsity games at Oregon High School in 19, was it 67, 68, yes. And I got to see uh, one of my best friends, Steve Nicholson, and Billy Pana, Lou Hudson, all those guys played for Coach Larry Henson. And Coach Larry Henson was a new varsity coach here. And uh, I told Coach uh, Bobby Brown, when I, after that game, I said, I'm gonna be a varsity basketball player. I will to high school someday. And uh, the fruition, one of my dreams you know, came true and that happened. Fast forward to that, um, I had a stellar career. I averaged uh, 30 points a game. My senior year, about 23, my junior year, made, uh, I think I made uh, first team all conference. No, yes, first team all conference, Cahokia conference team. My junior year, my senior year, I was MVP, most valuable player in the Coquitlam Conference, and uh, I had scored 38 points, which is the most points scored in the history of our high school program. And with that being said, that was out without the three-point arc, you know. Oh, you didn't have the three-point line no. I still put 38 points up on, on, on the score, and that, and that record still holds to this day. And uh, you know, I was just really fortunate putting those pieces together. So fast forward, not really dragging the story out, but um, Coach Henson and I are still lifelong friends. I talked to him like once a week. Um, uh, just this past year in the pandemic, we were uh, both uh, inducted into the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association uh, Hall of Fame. He was inducted as the career coach, Hall of Fame in class of 2020. And uh, I was inducted as a player from Oregon High School. I was ranked the number one player in the last 100 years at Oregon High School, and I was inducted in the same class. The induction took place last August of 2021 because of the pandemic and COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went to Illinois State University, went to a reception, and we had the induction. And it was a, it was a, it was a great honor being inducted to IBCA along with my high school coach. It's been the first time, I think, in the history of the Illinois Basketball Coach Association where a, a, a coach and a player were inducted in on the same, the same year. But I've been along that journey. I've been very, very blessed. I've always, you know, had a passion for the game, and I had an opportunity when I moved out here in '81. Uh, almost about 20 years, I played Venice Beach basketball, and I was inducted in class of 20, 2012 as uh, a member of the Hall of Fame in Venice Beach basketball. I got the medal. So that along with a good friend of mine, Mike Moore. There was about uh, two dozen of us who were inducted that year in 2012. And uh, not to, I mean, I, I think I, I even grew more fond in terms of playing with the high competition with a lot of foreign players, playing European basketball, coming back to Venice and professional players and, uh, you know, competing, competing against them, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's how I evolved into, you know, coaching because I love that competitive spirit. I love being around a game and playing a game. Uh, another piece was um, in the Hall of Fame. That was my first one in 2012. 2020 was my third one. But in between, Quinn Buckner was the number one ranked player in Illinois State of Illinois from Thorn Ridge High School out of Chicago. 
Yeah. Coach Rocky Moore, I love him, was ranked number 16 in the top 20 top players in the state of Illinois. And so that's where I got my recognition. So Waterloo High School honored me, and it was an honor and a privilege to be inducted to Waterloo High School sports as a basketball player. Uh -huh. And uh, I really honored my high school coach, Larry Hanson, Coach Bobby Brown and his wife, Donna Brown, they were there uh, in attendance to support me, uh, along with Coach Hanson. And, uh, you know, it was, a nice, it was a, a nice honor. So those three Hall of Fames really, um, inductions really uh, are close to my heart and my best. And the bottom line is all the relationships and the journey to go along with it. But fast forward, um, when I moved out here to Southern California, actually, uh, before I joined Stan Morrison's staff, I met Coach Jim Herrick. I wanted to be on the staff at Pepperdine University, but he introduced me to Jerry Mormon, who was a head varsity coach at Palisades High School. And at the time, it's a real quick story. Um, coach Harry sent me down to Palisades High School. Uh -huh. And he said, Coach Mormon's waiting on you. He had an open position on his staff uh, to be the BC head coach and also be a varsity assistant. So uh -huh. I jumped on the opportunity, drove straight down to campus from Pepperdine U, straight down that day, that afternoon. And Coach Marvin, Jerry Marvin, got rested so Great coach. His dad was a legendary coach at uh, University High School in Los Angeles. And Coach Marvin won the CF Championship in 1969. So I was around great coaches, great people, even getting into my coaching career. Mm -hmm. um, before I finish that story, I'm going to tell you the story when I walked into Palisades Gym for the very first time. But dial it back, my best, one of my best experiences playing ball, and I know I'm going to fast forward, but I'm going to rewind the tape. Before I went to Northeast Missouri State, I got a scholarship run of a high school at one of the, the 10 middle area college, which was a two year um, junior college under the NJCAA at uh, Middle Area College, which was in um, Flatbird, Missouri at the time, but it's now called Park Hills, Missouri. And it's about 85 minute drive from my hometown, one of the uh, southern Missouri, southeast Missouri. And uh, in my trial, I had an opportunity. Um, to try out, you know, get my workout in. Coach Seekers came up to my home and visited my parents and my high school coach. And he, uh, I was recruited by a lot of Three Rivers Community College, Bill Larry College, a lot of other girls from Clark, a lot of JCs in the Southern Illinois and Missouri area to continue my playing career. Uh -huh. And Coach Bobby Seekers came to home and, you know, he won us over. Great personality, great coach, legendary coach. He's in the NJCAA Hall of Fame. And, uh, when I had that opportunity to try out, I was an incoming freshman. He had a returning player by the name of Sonny Parker. Sonny Parker out of Southside Chicago. Sonny Parker is the father of Jabari Parker, who was drafted uh -huh. in 2014. Uh -huh. He was supposed to, he was predicted to go number one, but he can't, He was picked number two behind Andrew Wiggins, who's now playing for Golden State Warriors. He's playing for Coach Steve Kerr. But, um, when I did my tryout and working out with Coach, I mean with uh, Sonny for Coach Park uh, Secrets, um, we were playing in the half court level. Uh, you know, I mean, I was way on top of the key, but I mean, I just threw an air pass. And, you know, we're not talking about the square on the glass. We're talking about top of the glass backboard. I threw an air pass up to the corner, right hand side. I thought it was going over the glass. And six six and Parker flew out of the air like nowhere, cuffed it, dunked it, came by me, slapped me on the side of my head, and he says, "Nice pass, Saltine." Please call me Cracker. So it's crazy uh -huh. like that pass he told Coach Coach C to give me a scholarship and the rest of history. So he went on to Texas A&M. I was supposed to go to Texas A&M with him on a full scholarship with Sonny because that was my that was my guy. And he wanted me to go, but uh, Coach Seek said, hey, you know, you need to get your education and matriculate through here and, uh, you know, bigger and better things are going to happen next season for you. Well, it did. I ended up being the captain of the team. Sonny had a career year at Southwest Conference at Texas A&M, and then he was drafted. Played six years in the NBA for Golden State Warriors. And then I had the opportunity to finish up my second year at Menlo College, and we won a regional 16 championship team. The fun part about that series, like in, in JCAA, you play two out of three series, mm -hmm. and in the first game we beat State Fair out of uh, Sedalia, Missouri. And uh, 
there's a little story to that because um, Coach Seacrest had a, a game plan on defense, you know, like I think it was tight school or down one, yeah. and he wanted to make sure I was in my defense alignment, you know, we side rotate. But Coach Rock, imagine it, like you don't have, you have a lot of hair on top, right? Yeah. Well, I had long hair. Who mentioned I had like, back in the day, yeah, Coach was it. You know, way back in the good times, you know. Uh -huh. You ever heard of Woodstock? Yeah. Then you'd understand. Anyway, as I came out of the huddle, but you know how I grabbed you a couple times in the headlock? Yeah. He wouldn't grab me in the headlock. He, like back in the day, he grabbed back of my hair, he pulled me in, he says, he looked me in the eye, you know, like I looked at you in your eyes. Like, uh -huh. He said, do you understand slipping weak side ball line? I go, yes, sir. He said, you don't jump that ball line. You gonna walk back from Sedalia back to Flat Creek, Missouri? I said, okay. I'd have been a long walk, but you know, oh. I took him serious, and sure enough, the play um, evolved, and they threw that weak side pass, and the ball just literally—I mean, I didn't even jump the line; it just literally landed in my hands, and I went off down the other court. I really wanted to dunk it, but I wanted to make the shot, so I went up there and just laid it in, and one by one. And after all the melee, coach says, "Hey, man, you get your steak dinner." For the rest of the year. No, that was a great, great uh, memory. And then I loved how he coached. So those coaches kind of evolved. When I went to Northeast Missouri State, it was, it was it was a great experience. But I felt the community college at junior college. I mean, he did everything for his class. And when I went, now the best thing playing at Northeast Missouri State, I realized my junior year playing the NBA. I mean, my dreams was to play professional basketball. Yeah, I had an opportunity, um, really to continue. But it came to the realization I need to get my education. All my coaches were telling me, hey, you get your degree, get your degree. So I kind of focused, I changed my focus. I, I really loved my professors, you know, yeah. that I had an opportunity to work with. And they got me on the right track in terms of my edu educational program, my uh, education goals. So what's your biggest regret as a player? I think my biggest regret is not fulfilling my dreams. Playing as a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, from I met Coach Stan Morrison at Gladstone's uh, Fishery Restaurant um, on Pacific Coast Highway, and on a handshake, he hired me as one of the assistants. Um, I had an offer to play in South America on a professional contract. Coach Stan Morrison was familiar with a lot of overseas coaches and programs we had, and he set that all up for me. Yeah, and. I was already getting settled in Southern California in 81, 82. I had a great run with Coach Marvin. And he blessed me. I mean, he really wanted me to stay on staff, but if I could go coach at USC with Coach Morrison, and we had uh, Kevin Stewart and Carl Washington, two players that Coach recruited. So I went with him and I had that opportunity. I'm going, man, if this coach is willing to help me get a contract to play overseas, how much would I learn on him? as his prodigy coach of basketball. I think I made the right decision at the time. Here's the only regret I had. Uh, Manny, the only regret I had, and there's one or two of one, when I was with him on his staff at USC for two years from 82 to 84, yeah. and we've talked about it since then, I had a chance to get my PhD from USC. And I didn't jump on that opportunity. And I know he's already said, he, he, he paid my way. He picked up my tab. I had a full scholarship. I could have a PhD if I had a vision, you know. But I was young, so my mid twenties. My second regret: not playing professionally, you know, because I always. But what was great when I was playing against the D1 play, our players in the USC and the roster, what have you, I earned respect right away because I knew that I could play. And with that instant gratification and admiration, respect, that's an easy chewing. But here's the thing, with all my graduate work, I just got out of graduate school in 79, so I got the job at 81, right? Or at 82, a couple, two, three years later. I lived in the uh, Doheny Library as a proctor. That's where you did? Yeah, monitored. I lived literally like Sunday through Thursday, three hours a night. I worked with all the players. I was responsible for them, making sure they were on time, they did their studies. Back then, we didn't have technology. Yeah. You can ask your grandparents about car catalog or pop hair. Car catalog. Car catalog. I work at Doheny. Car catalog. 
for, for the cars if I, you know, your resources and your materials. Uh -huh. So it was a learning learning experience. Coach loved the kind of job I did with him, but I thought I was going to get promoted. But I'm going to get into that story. But those are two finances that I think, two top regrets that I think would have shaped. You know what? There was one more, and it was a silent, it was a silent keeper, uh -huh. and really nobody knows this now to your program here. I'll reveal it. In 1984, I was at the uh, Final Four up in Seattle, Washington. Coach Seekers, Bobby Seekers, and Coach Charlie Spooner tracked me down and found me and says, We want to offer you a coach seek, want you to come back home and be an assistant coach for one year and take over any coaching job at Middle Larry College. I didn't like the cold, I didn't like snow, and I really loved being with my dad in Southern California because I didn't see him for a while. That yeah. reconnection, that father son bond is kind of special. And I made a promise that I would come out and visit him with it, but I didn't know that Southern California was going to grow on me like it did. Mm -hmm. But career wise, I think if you just Google Corey Tate, Coach Corey Tate, and one of the most successful runs at Middle America College, and now he's assistant coach at St. Louis University, Billikens. Great story about him. What's the guard's name? Uh, Place for Washington. Not that was that Washington Wizards. Jeremy Bill, because he played with the traveling team, saying, well, huh? that was one of uh, Coach Corey Tate's kids. How about the, the Boston Celtic kid? What's his name? The big kid, he's from St. Louis. Who's one of the most popular players in the Boston Celtics? Uh, we're there. Who? Wait, right now? Right now. White kid or black kid? He's African American. Black complected, tall. Uh, Played at Duke. Tatum? Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum. There's two. Jeremy Bill, Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum played on that traveling team in St. Louis, too. That was one of the coach, Corey Tate's kids, too, out of St. Louis. Big time players. So anyway, I had a good run, and now I was assistant with the Billikens. And, you know, I mean, you know, it's kind of maybe a regret, career-wise, you know? Yeah. But God's got a plan, man. I was supposed to be in 21, 22, coaching this with my Now that, you know, a four years ago. So, you know, I, it regrets when you make choices, you know, but I have. Uh, how, do you think, how do you think you would have done overseas? Probably would have been highly successful. I know, if you I would, would, have, would have played in South America? I would have played in South America. Guadalajara. Down in South America, yeah. Mm -hmm. What team? Um, you know what? At that time, he, that was back in 1982, 83, 84. I was offered that contract. And the, the people who were on the team, they reached out to me and offered me crazy opportunity. Everything. To go down there and play. And when I mean everything, like everything was, you know, taken care of. Yeah. And, uh, but you know what? I just I just felt the fit was good and I want to get my coaching career started. And that's you know, that that's the decision I made at the same time. And I had no regrets about that because I got to work two years with Coach Dan Morrison and I that kinda laid the foundation while I was out here in Southern California and me make it on my own. Like start uh, started my uh, coaching career in Southern California. I mean it jumps around a little bit, you know, but it got started, yeah. So what's your, what was your biggest fear as a player? Like, did you have any? No, I, I mean, I, I think I was pretty much fearless. Yeah, you know, I mean, my coach, they had a big article in me in the middle of college, like the colorful Rocky War player, man. I mean, you know how to teach like going after loose balls, taking charges, yeah. you know, and Coach Seek loved the energy enthusiasm and the positivity I brought, but I did everything in all the other areas, so I kind of, I was fearless. You know what I mean? I wasn't afraid to take a charge, I wasn't afraid to go for it. I wasn't afraid to, you know, and like, there's one play this year with our mock program that stood out that reminded me of my style of play. Um, actually, there's two. One, I'm going with the first one, when Finn Finn, uh, and he went on the floor at the after he missed a gimme. Oh. But the ball was discombobulated, fell on the floor, what have you, but he dove 
face first and he grabbed the possession, right? And we still upset him, but he got a possession. We had like, we had one possession lead, we had a two point lead still, right? Yeah. I think the next possession you were able to hit the three, but he got a possession because he got on the floor through his ball. That's the epitome of effort, the sacrifice your body for the sake of the team's success. So he's playing for all his team, team teammates on offense in who's in front of him. If you play on defense, you play for everybody behind you. So he did that in front and got that ball and possessed it. Remember during a timeout? Yeah. So I'm looking at that, man, that's a little bit of me and like Fin Fin getting that one extra possession. What happened? The guy went under, what have you, we had possession, we stepped to the three and we separated. Now it's like a two possession game. You knocked down the three. You remember that? I remember the ball was this okay, we needed a rebound against that Christian school out of uh, Orange County. And the ball was ricocheting. You got the ball right in the middle of the paint, right? Uh -huh. And they hit you so hard, you should have fell down to the ground. But a knocked your woman in, into the possession of the ball, and he came down with it. And then they had five. But that was a secure possession on a rebound that he had set. Because in, in a close game, you don't get beat on the first shot. You get beat on the offensive rebound in the second and third opportunity when they catch it and put the foot back. Or you get beat if they get deep, like Tatum against the Brooklyn Nets. He got beat on a play where he's able to drop set and score. Mm -hmm. He can't get that up. He can't stop it. Remember, remember the plays I'm talking about? Yeah. That's, but I don't know. I think fear before the game. I had a ritual, man. I had, I don't know what to put it out there. I had to go to the bathroom. I had butterflies. I had these knots in my stomach. Because I knew I really cared. And I guess the fear, I didn't want to let my teammates down. I didn't want to let my coach down. And I, and I played as hard as I possibly could. I mean, to the point where they thought I was like a, a crazy player, a crazy coach. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it transfers over, you know? So, that, I mean, that's that, that fear. Before, but when the ball goes up and you start playing, butterflies go away. Now you're in competitive mode. So, I didn't back down from anybody. And that was taught and ingrained in me at a very young age. And I'm like, you know, I mean, um, I'm, I'm honored and privileged and also blessed, you know, to be here. Because I had like three strikes to get me, you know, when I first moved out here. Obviously, little pieces, putting pieces together. I was in an air fatal automobile accident mm -hmm. where the car was cut in two. I said, well, I drunk driver. I should have been a statistic, but it flipped the front end, not broadside me. Obviously, if it broadside me, you and I wouldn't be having this podcast, you know, interview session going on right now. But I was blessed. And, but I had put my pieces together before. You know, my jaw was washed out. That's why Coach Bones got that scar here, that um, pin here, ripped knees. So I was able to bounce back and be resilient. But I was young then and stronger, so I was able to. It, it helped me with a lot of, uh, a lot of growth. You know, what I mean, and I wouldn't wish that for anybody, but I end up on now, still up on the top side. And then uh, I had a couple. I had another one, and and. It was a close call in terms of automobile accident, but I survived it. And then last one was uh, I had a chance. Uh, it was a health condition, but I was able to bounce back. You know, yeah. so you know, those are I call them blessings. And I, I'm a firm believer in that. Those are blessings. So um, that's why I'm paying it forward. That's why I'm still coaching. And that's why I'm at now. Your biggest regret as a player. I think my biggest regret is not fulfilling my dreams playing as a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, from, I met Coach Stan Morrison at Gladstone's so fishery restaurant um, on Pacific Coast Highway. And on a handshake, he hired me as one of the assistants. Um, I had an offer to play in South America on a professional contract. Coach Stan Morrison was familiar with a lot of overseas coaches and programs we had, and he set that up. Yeah. And I was already getting settled in Southern California in 81, 82. I had a great run with Coach Marvin. He blessed me. I mean, he really wanted me to stay on staff, but 
I can go coach at USC with Coach Morrison. And we had uh, Kevin Stewart and Carl Washington, two players that coach recruited. So I went with them. And I had that opportunity. I'm going, man, if this coach is willing to help me get a contract to play overseas, how much would I learn on him as his prodigy coach of basketball? I think I made the right decision at the time. Here's the only regret I had. Uh, man, and the only regret I had, and there's one of two of one, when I was with him on his staff at USC for two years from 82 to 84, yeah. and we've talked about it since then, I had a chance to get my PhD from USC. And I didn't jump on that opportunity. And I know he's already said, he, he, he paid my way. He picked up my dad. I'd had a full scholarship. I could have a PhD if I had a vision, you know. But I was young. It's in my mid-20s. My second regret, not playing professionally. You know, because I always, but what was great when I was playing against the D1 play, our players in the USC and the roster, what have you, I earned respect right away because I knew that I could play. And with that instant gratification and admiration and respect, that's easy chewing. But here's the thing, with all my graduate work, I just got out of graduate school in 79, so I got the job at 81, right? Or at 82, a couple, two, three years later. I lived in the uh, Doheny Library as a proctor. That's what you did? Yeah, I monitored. I lived literally like Sunday through Thursday, three hours a night. I worked with all the players I was responsible for. I'm making sure they're on time. They did their studies. Back then, we didn't have technology. Yeah. You could ask your grandparents about car catalog or pop hair. Car catalog. Car catalog. I work at Doheny. Car catalog. Flip through the cars if I, you know, your resources and your materials. Uh -huh. So it was a learning learning experience. Coach loved the kind of job I did with him, but I thought I was going to get promoted. But I want to get into that story. But those are two finds that I think two top regrets that I think would have shaped. You know what? There was one more, and it was a silent, a, a silent keeper, uh -huh. and really nobody knows this now to your program here. I'll reveal it. In 1984, I was at, at the uh, Final Four up in Seattle, Washington. Coach Secrets, Bobby Secrets and Coach Charlie Spooner tracked me down and found me and says, you want to offer you a coach seat, once you come back home and be an assistant coach for one year and take over any coaching job at Middle Larry College. I didn't like the cold, I didn't like snow, and I really loved being with my dad in Southern California because I didn't see him for a while. That yeah. connection, that father-son bond is kind of special. And I made a promise that I would come out and visit him with it, but I didn't know that Southern California was going to grow on me like it did. Mm -hmm. But career-wise, I think if you just Google Corey Tate, Coach Corey Tate, and one of the most successful runs at Middle America College, and I was assistant coach at St. Louis University, Billy Kings. Great story about him. What's the guard's name? Uh, Place for Washington. Not double was that Wars, Washington Wizards. Jeremy Bibb, because he played with the traveling team, saying, well, no. that was one of uh, Coach Corey Tate's kids. How about the, the Boston Celtic kid? What's his name? The big kid. He's from St. Louis. Who's one of the most popular players in the Boston Celtics? Uh, Who? Wait, right now? Right now. Jason Tatum. There's a two. Jeremy Bill, Jason Tatum. Jason Tatum played on that traveling team in St. Louis, too. That was one of Coach Corey Tate's kids, too, out of St. Louis. Big time players. So anyway, he had a good run, and now I was assistant with the Billy Kins, and, you know, I mean, you know, it's kind of maybe a regret, career-wise, you know? Yeah. But God's got a plan, man. I'm supposed to be in 21, 22, coach at Bishop of Mott. Now that, you know, about four years from so, you know, I, I regrets when you make choices, you know, but I have. Uh, how, do you think, how do you think you would have done overseas? Oh, I would have been highly successful. I know, if you I would have played play in South America? I would have played in South America. Guadalajara. Down in South America, yeah. Mm -hmm. What team? Um, you know what? At that time, he, that was back in 1982, 83, 84. I was offered that contract. And the, the people 
you know, on the team, they reached out to me and offered me crazy opportunity, everything to go down there and play. And when I mean everything, like everything was, you know, taken care of. Yeah. And, uh, but you know what? I just, I just felt the fit was good and I wanted to get my coaching career started. And that's, you know, that, that's the decision I made at the same time. And I had no regrets about that because I got to work two years with Coach Stan Morrison and I, that kind of laid the foundation while I was out here in Southern California and me make it on my own. Like, Start, uh, started my uh, coaching career in Southern Cal. I mean, it jumped around a little bit, you know, but it got started. Yeah. So, what's your what was your biggest fear as a player? Like, did you have any? No, I, I mean, I, I think I was pretty much fearless. Yeah, I mean, my coach had a big article of me and you know, our guys like the colorful Rocky Moore player, man. I mean, you know how to teach like going after loose balls, taking charges. Yeah. You know, and Coach Seek loved the energy, enthusiasm, and the positivity I brought. But I did everything in all the other areas, so I kind of I was fearless. You know, what I mean, I wasn't afraid to take a charge. I wasn't afraid to go out for after this ball. I wasn't afraid to, you know, and like there's one play this year with our mock program that stood out that reminded me of my style of play. Um, Actually, there's two. One I rolled with the first one when Finn Finn, uh, and he went on the floor at the after he missed a gimme, oh. but the ball was just combobulated, fell on the floor, what have you. But he dove face first and grabbed the possession, right? And we're still upset, but he got a possession. We had like we had one possession lead, but a two point lead still, right? Yeah. I think the next possession you were able to hit the three, but he got a possession because he got on the floor through his ball. That's the epitome of effort, the sacrifice your body for the sake of the team's success. So he's playing for all his team, team teammates on offense in who's in front of him. You play on defense, you play for everybody behind you. So he did that in front and got that ball and possessed it. Remember during a timeout? Yeah. So I'm looking at that, man, that's a little bit of me and like Fin Fin. He had that one extra possession. What happened? The guy went under, what have you, and possessed him, he stepped to the three. And, you separate it now, it's like a two position game. You knock down a three. You remember that? I remember the ball was dislocated. We needed a rebound against that Christian school out of uh, Orange County. And the ball was ricocheting. You got the ball right in the middle of the paint, right? Uh -huh. And they hit you so hard, you should have fell down to the ground. But it knocked you moment into the possession of the ball. He came down with it. And then they had five. But that was a secure possession on a rebound. They didn't get sick. Because in, in a close game, you don't get beat on the first shot. You get beat on the offensive rebound on the second and third opportunity when they catch it and put the good back. Or you get beat if they get deep, like Tatum against the Brooklyn Nets. He got beat on a play where he's able to drop set and score. Mm -hmm. He can't get that up. He can't stop it. Remember, remember the plays I'm talking about? Yeah. That's. But. I don't know. I think fear before the game. I had a ritual, man. I had, I don't know what to put it out there. I had to go to the bathroom. I had butterflies. I had these knots in my stomach. Because I knew I really cared. And I guess the fear, I didn't want to let my teammates down. I didn't want to let my coach down. And I, and I played as hard as I possibly could. I mean, to the point where they thought I was like that crazy player. A crazy coach, yeah. You know, it, it 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 transfers over, you know. So, that, I mean, that's that, that fear. Before, but when the ball goes up and you start playing, butterflies go away. Now you're in competitive mode. So, I didn't back down from anybody, and that was taught and ingrained in me at a very young age. And I'm like, you know, I made. Um, I'm, I'm honored and privileged and also blessed, you know, to be here because I had like three strikes to get me, you know, when I first moved out here. Obviously, little pieces, putting pieces together. I was in an air fatal automobile accident mm -hmm. where the car was cut in two. I said, well, I drunk driver. I should have been a statistic, but it flipped the front end, not broadside me. Obviously, if it broadside me, you and I wouldn't be having this podcast, you know, interview. 
session going on right now. But I was blessed. And but I had put my pieces together before. You know? My jaw was washed out, that's why Coach Boy's got that scar here. Got oh. pinned here. Ripped knees, so I was able to bounce back and be resilient. But I was young then and stronger. So I was able to it helped me with a lot of uh, a lot of growth. You know what I mean? And I wouldn't wish that for anybody, but I end up on now. Still up on the top side. And then uh, I had a couple, I had another one. And, and it was a close call in terms of automobile accident, but I survived it. And then last one was, uh, I had a chance, uh, it was a health condition, but I was able to bounce back, you know? Yeah. So, you know, those are, I call them blessings. I'm a firm believer in that. Those are blessings. So um, that's why I'm paying it forward. That's why I'm still coaching. And that's why I'm at now. Tell us about the Australia Championship team that year. Sure can. The very first CF Championship. One was in 1993. And I had a great point guard mm -hmm. in Jack Mon, who was. Uh, I can tell about him. Like what, what same part from everyone else? I mean, I think his uh, sheer determination, his commitment, his dedication is, you know, I mean, he was so far mature. His emotional maturity taught us. I mean, he was far head and shoulders above everybody else. And I got to attribute that to uh, Jock's older brothers and also his mom, Lenny Vaughn, who, uh, you know, had high expectations for him to achieve at a high level. A strong Christian kid, just believed in himself, had a lot of self-confidence and visibility. He worked hard. He was a hard worker in practice. But his, his play, his performance in practice in the game, he practiced the way he played, he played the way he practiced, and he led by example. You know, all the way through high school, academically, he only earned one B. And that was a question mark. He would have had straight A's all the way through. With all of his academic achievements, he was National Player of the Year in 1993, and we received the dollar award. I think uh, that had a lot to do with his his home, his upbringing, and you know, his parents and family. And Lane Vaughn wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, before he even studied, uh, started his studies, you know, he's on one knee. He loved studying from, you know, his bedside. That's all I need to watch. But he, he had, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes of Bible study time. He had to read scripture. He had to read God's Word. And so that foundation was there. And he had faith, he trusted the process, and he believed, you know, a lot of faith and, you know, and when you do good things, good things come back to you, the tenfold. And, uh, you know, I had a great relationship with his mom, his brothers, and, and him. And I had him for three years as a sophomore and inherited. But on that team as a sophomore, I inherited nine Division One players. And so by the time he matriculated, I had another player, Michael Quinn, was an integral part of our Seattle championship team in 93. Jock was a point guard as a quarterback. Michael was the wing player who played above the rim. And then I had a sophomore. Um, his name was Dwayne Curtis. His first team all Seattle as a senior in uh, 95. All those kids I mentioned got full scholarships, but uh, they set the tone in our program. And um, I can assure you, because of peer pressure, because of Jock, no one is going to take any time off in practice. And you know how hard I push in practice. Yeah. You're talking about 17s? Well, how many of you guys do? Less than a half full this year? We did like two. Yeah. We, you know, you, you said we did like two, maybe three? Yeah. 17s, right? Yeah. Well, you could put two zeros behind us. So after all coach year, we did two out of three. Out of so you can imagine whose conditioning was better mentally, emotionally, spiritually, holistically in terms of competing, uh -huh. we can play three, two, three games in a row and not get tired. Your kids, you're going through the most rapid growth period in your life. You bounce back. You're not playing the NBA. You're not playing G League. You're not playing major cup. You're in high school. Every two minutes. Come on. So they they embraced the challenge. And now on top of the 17s, I took them down to Roseville Hill. We went to Roseville Hill. They know what it's about. It's all about Steep incline, spreading up the hill, jogging back down, getting 
uh, physical condition on. So that was a special team. And with those kids, they let us win. And, uh, you know, we, it was a great game um, in 93 because uh, they had Demetrius Kyle, shooting guard. We were up at uh, Camarillo High School, and they had a kid named name Jeff Harbour, who went to Stanford uh, back then. First team all Seattle, all American, all American player. He's at the free throw line, and uh, he was at he was about ready to shoot a one one front end one one, and yeah. they were up one already. He could separate it and put him up two, but he, he missed the front end in that one one, and we brought it down the court. And man, I called it. I called the timeout, and uh, there were about six seconds left on the clock. They mounted, and I asked one of the the team. I mean, I asked the team, you know, who wants to get the shot? Damn it, Demetri Carter said. I'm going to teach you. That game right there set the foundation. Right? 92 to catapult us to see our championship. Because we won a road game that was almost unbelievable. And we did the ex execution off the Jock did the reverse dribble and ran it to a tee, hit Demetrius in the corner. I was hoping that officials would have called him stepping out on the baseline, but he got set. He had an awareness about it. Three, two, one, the horn shot. It wasn't even in the ring yet. Hit nothing but net. And then one by two. But they put two more seconds on the clock. They were on chance. So we got out of town. We got escorted. That led us to the CF Championship in, in, in 93. And we played the Artesian. They had a Andre Jones, 6'11 kid, and uh, Charles O'Bannon Jr. That advantage of the guy. They had those two players. And I had an advantage because. Coach Papa Pete Moore being my defensive game plan for the 93 team. Uh -huh. And then we played it to a T. And how he suggested to me to take Jock Vaughn as a point guard, right? Put him on the Lucas offensive player, but put him down in the paint and play him like a safety and got, you know, and put him on like a safety, a safety back. I put him down in the paint and played ball line. He said put more pressure on their guards so they have longer distance so you know when they're coming from the top of the key to left wing or right wing. Push them out, extended, and if it's an entry pass from the wing to the elbow or down to the block, it's a longer pass. So I came up with a triple double. I had about 11 and 12 steals. Still holds a record with most assists in a career and also single season assists in CIF. So we stayed with the game plan and Jock Brown with his teammates executed it. And then we also had Michael Quinn his senior year, 6'6. Six, six. Um, he played above the rim, and like I said, Dwayne Critter. Can really stick it. And then I had some great kids. Jay, Jamal Johnson went to Santa Barbara. Uh, Warrior Boswell, who designs big men's clothes for the NBA and NFL, he was part of that team. But they were just a tight knit group of guys who really battled for each other. So not only that, winning the staff championship because I had great players like that, and because I want to acknowledge this, even with Jock Vaughn, um, I learned the Los Angeles Times, Coach of the Year, in 1993. And the thing is, is I, I was like so humble, you know. I didn't, I didn't tell anybody. I, I just went to the presentation on my own because I, I just felt like, yeah, I was a coach of the year because I had an All American, McDonald's All American, yeah. Jack Brown, the only uh, McDonald's All American. I could have had a couple more, but they didn't listen to me, performing academically. But he was co MVP of the McDonald's All American game with Jerry Stockhouse. He played in North Carolina, and that's his history. But, you know, I, I was blessed to have some great talent. Move forward from the 93 championship team, um, oh, it was our first one. Yeah. Dollar back Jack sophomore year, we lost by one point to Tustin, who won the state championship. And what it should have could have, we had a six point lead. You know, like our lead this year, in my playing at Dana Hill, we had a six point lead against us. Yeah, and we lost by one. That was my state championship team, my very first team, because I had nine Division One players on that team, and I didn't make an adjustment because of my my ego, because I really wanted to push us to get out of press, didn't make the adjustment, pull us back. I could have saved our legs a little bit better. Darren Green went to San Jose State. Eric Scott went to Sac State. Coach Rock, we'd have done anything, everything for you, and they did. They busted the rums for me, and but all I had to do was make an adjustment. I didn't have my coach on the staff to help me like that, but I did with Coach Bob. 
Coach Robert Ackbar. After that 93 championship game, he came out of the stands. And um, he said, congratulations, Coach Rockford. I really want to get into coaching. He gave me a list of this paperwork, with my contacts, my plans, my goals, what I can do. Will you hire me on your staff? 1993. And I said, yeah. Guess who was on my staff next year? Coach Rockford. Coach Rockford said, Coach Rock." I'll do everything else. How, how do you think we can win a Seattle championship ring? I said, follow this ABC formula. Always be committed. Be prepared. Compete. The ABC. Not really hard, is it? Real simple. Always be prepared. Right? Be committed. Mm-hmm. And you know what? One of the best assistant coaches I've ever had, John Nash. Loyal, dedicated. Fast forward, how we earned a 96 half championship. Jock Brown was a kingpin, but he had some go to players that, you know, that could get it done. And then, and then fast forward to the 96 half championship team, had a kid by the name of Quincy Stinson. Um, he did everything I asked of him. Uh, it was, uh, a challenging journey for him, but he embraced the challenges. He was only 5'11", but he played like he's 6'11". You know, he played like with a heart of gold, very competitive. He had KJ, he's 5'4", my starting point guard, Anthony Masquiel. Had a good nucleus, Darius Brown, Steve Collier, Chris Scott. Had a good nucleus. Players that played their role but complimented big time players. And Quincy turned into being a scorer. He knew how to get buckets. So Quincy had, his line was, 33 points, I don't know if it was nine rebounds, eight assists, or eight rebounds, nine assists. Uh-huh. But even nine, he was responsible for, do the math, 51 of our 75 points. That's an amazing statistic. And uh, let me dial it back. We play, uh, I think Sierra, I can't, he can tell you. This team out of Orange County, and we played them at Pasadena High School. And we run a play, right? We ran a play on a missed free throw situation. And uh, we're, I think we're, it's tied score, we're down one. But we ran the free throw line fast break downhill. And I want you to run over the defender and make the official make the call. And, and those guys, yeah, they're so smart. I mean, I go back to 93 team, ask Jack Bond, I said, will you bust your butt for Coach Rock running through a brick wall? And he did heck no, Coach. What do you mean? Jack, what JD, what do you mean? He goes, Coach, I'll bust my butt to the brick wall for you, but you know what? I'll find a way to get a pick or something and pick that brick apart and create a hole and I'll get to it for you. I'm going, man. I mean, I'm a young coach, but these guys understood it on a whole deeper level. Because they lived, breathed basketball and competed at a high level. Like Jack was on the Slam Jam team playing with Izzy Washington team. Yeah, it's crazy. And then uh, we had fast forward to uh, the 1960s, man. That was Quincy. He led by example. Quiet player, but led by example. He take players aside and give them the coach rock speech. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, you're in it to win it, or you're not gonna be a part of it. And uh, like I said, he played at the pond. And, and, and so that semifinal game, they ran that play to a tee, and Quincy had the ball downhill, and he beat everybody down. And he ran; he's going for a shot. The guy, you know, what I mean, it was a big game play, but the defender got there late, so the Fisher called it. Time expired. <laughs> he went to the free throw line. He, I mean, packed house, crowd noise. He did everything he could with his chicken legs to get his shot up over the rim and it just rimmed right over the rim, you know, like used every part of the rim and it went in. So it tied the game up by one. Next one, he got his routine going out, he looked over at me, he winked at me, like, this is money. Snapped his whip lock a little bit, snapped the wrist, nothing that. Next thing I knew, pandemonium, he was the bottom of the pile and everyone went, melee went crazy, it was chaos. And, we advanced on to our second CF championship for four years. And then he put on that kind of performance. You know, we uh, got beat by the Walton Brothers. 
Luke Walton, Michael Walton. Bill Walton was in the house at the University of Hyde in San Diego. We made it to the uh, semifinals. And if we won that game, we went on to play at State. So that's how close it was. But Quincy was the guy, 96, along with Ant, Steve, Adam Collins, Chris Scott, Darius Brown, KJ, Kevin Johnson. And Quincy was a, the, the silent leader, mm -hmm. where Jock was more the vocal leader. And, 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 and Quincy even had an opportunity to play great professional basketball. Yeah. But at the time, and we talked about it late this year, I said, you should have taken that opportunity. Because if you're good as you are and you go and compete and you accelerate, um, you never know what's behind you doing number one, doing number two, doing number three. You always opportunity is it's even gonna be better than you even think or even believe. When you you know, when you when you make the right choices and do the right thing. So that's what happened. That's how we won those championships and you know, I, I get a lot of credit for it, but you know, I had uh, great kids that were totally committed and did everything I asked of them. And, yeah, I'm serious. The, those teams were like they were like a rock and roll band. I mean, they had more fans and followers, and you know, there's hundreds of people want to get in those games, and and the, and the games were a little bit different back back in that, those days than it is compared to today. But uh, how would how would the game change since you were at? Oh, the game the game has changed drastically. You know, what I mean, mm -hmm. I kind of agree with Coach Popovich. Is it really basketball? If you, if, you know, Sauce, if you watch an NBA game, is it one on one? Like, is it one on one? But what are they shooting? Like threes. Okay. You take a three, I'll take a three. You take a three, I'll take a three. In the NBA game? Yeah. The NBA game, I mean, if you think about it, it's all levels high school to every level that you can think of to uh -huh. major college. I mean, the three ball, the three point shot, the three point arm changed the game tremendously. It's a different game, it's a different ball. I think, you know, Coach Kerr, not I'm biased, but they run an offense, you know, that's set and passing and movement, spacing, ball movement, player movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, they set a lot of uh, action screens on ball, down screen, diagonal screens, back screen, cross, get. And so the Boston Celtics, I mean, they, they really do a good job. And so does Phoenix Suns. But they're all, I mean, you know, look at Booker. Yeah. What's his first shot? If he's coming down on the fast break, is he taking it to the rack? Is he going to pull up? Pull up. What about Manny Hot Sauce? Is he going to take it to the rack? Is he going to pull up? Pull up. A three or taking it to the rack? Or well, depends who's in front of me. I don't care. What do you prefer? Well, if there's no one in front of me, I'll go take it to the rack. Very seldom. Yeah. Because you're learning how to take it to the rack. Uh -huh. I didn't say you didn't know how. You're learning how. Because what? You're conditioned to do what? Shoot the pull up. The three ball, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's not even a chess game. Like, who can make the most three ball? It's like, okay, let's play a basketball game. Who can make those most threes? I mean, do you see the game differently? If you see it differently than I do, then share it with me. The three ball and the three point shot has changed the game and evolved it. And then, it, then you got players who can really shoot and really worked at their craft and are artistic and they're dialed in that can really knock the three ball down like Steph Curry. Mm -hmm. LeBron James not even any close to the league like Steph Curry. Who else can shoot the three ball? In the NBA, uh, like Steph Curry, or who can you shoot besides Steph Curry? Okay. I know Ray Allen, Bridgie Miller, all those you know great players in the past. But I'm talking about Curry. Harden, Harden, Harden could shoot to three, right? But here's the question mark on Harden: his shot selection. If he had better shot selection, he'd probably be up. He'd probably be closer. But who's got the most threes in the NBA? Who's got the record? Steph Curry. Okay, but look at his shot collection. I mean, his shot selection. Look where he gets it up. He moves without the ball. Hard needs to hit the three with the ball. That's a big difference. 
Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And my question to you before we went like and had this break, what is the one missing link or one missing part of the game of basketball? Missing art? Yeah. The mid-range shot. Remember? You had a mid-range shot on the wing and you kept the momentum going and you would have saved your coach. Remember they called you stepping out of bounds, you went to the elbow, stopped foul, and you, you drained it, and you drained it? That's called a mid-range shot. Who taught you how to do that? They used to call him mid-range Manny last year. Mid-range Manny, now there's long range, AT&T. 120 to 130, three balls in one season. Because it's a set and shoot. But he probably would have had about 160, 30 more if our offense was complimented for you to get to it instead of set to it. You understand the difference of set and get? Yeah. So. Who's the, the most skilled player in the NBA? What's that? Who's the most skilled player in the NBA? Who's the most skilled player in the NBA? Kyrie. Kyrie Irving. Would you rather have Kyrie or Steph Curry? Oh, it's Steph. These are, I mean, Kyrie's won one. And he won one because Andre Iguodala didn't dunk the basketball. If I'm Andre 6'7", and do my homework to study. I know LeBron, he's got that recovery speed and he likes to block shots from behind. <laughs> I'm dunking the ball at 6 7. And I'm winning my fourth NBA title and not giving it up to Cleveland. But we can, there could be the argument that Steph Curry had Kevin Durant and Clay Thompson on his team. It doesn't matter how you utilize the team, and that's the current era. That's when LeBron James decided he wanted to go to South Beach. He changed the culture. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, are you trying to say that you'd rather have Steph Curry because he's won three and Kyrie's won one? Mm -hmm. But the rosters were very different. If Kyrie we're has, not talking about the roster. We're talking about who won what with what they had. Can you, play, can you play Steph Curry straight up if you have Kevin Durant on your team? Didn't they win one without Kevin Durant? They won one. Yeah. So but, they still Kyrie. Had it, but still, he still got three. Doesn't yeah. matter how you put the ingredients in it, you still got three. Because uh, Kyrie still had LeBron James, and he had still wholesome players, right? Who did he have on that team? So uh, Kyrie had LeBron, Steph had, and he won one. Steph had Clay, he got one. Mm -hmm. Then Steph got KD, and he got two more. If you add KD to the LeBron Kyrie team, they win. Okay. There's no doubt. There's no doubt, but that's 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 the nature of it. That's the landscape of the game, NBA game. So you said would have would have could have and all that stuff. You know, if I had if I had Deacon Tolliver. No, with, but see, the question I asked was, who would you rather have on your team? Steph Curry. And, and you why? Because you want to. That's what you said. Because you want more no, Curry. No, no, no. Because his is is basketball IQ. Okay. Ky see, Kyrie lets outside noise and distraction interfere with his game. Kyrie doesn't have that. I mean, no, Steph Curry doesn't have that. Does he? He doesn't, but Kyrie also is more outspoken in the media. Okay, well, it's true. So I'm building a team around Steph. I mean, and I, I think Kyrie's the best skilled, skilled player, bar none with everybody. But here's the thing. I mean, he's, he's got his challenges, like when he was Boston. He didn't like what was going on with him and LeBron James in the relationship with Cleveland. So if it's not happening, let's just pack up and go. It's a player's league. Players sell tickets. The reason why those arenas are packed, they don't come to see the coach. It's a player. It's a, it's a performance. It's an entertainment game. The game's out of hand. The game's like evolved to a whole nother level. Right? Mm -hmm. How much time was on the clock when you got the ball in the corner? Huh? It was like six seconds. Okay. Think about this. All we need is one point, right? What well, if you were drilled in condition that like you could have the three, but you could attack the basket too? And in that situation, you could have attacked the basket as well. All we need is one basket, right? I think it was two point seconds. Okay, it's so a two point second. But see, if we were conditioned with Christian getting the ball to you even sooner, yeah. instead of dribble, dribble, dribble down the court. The ball, passing the ball, learn how to fast break without the dribble. Get your high percentage look. We got a high percentage look, what's gonna happen? So let's dial it back to that play you had, stepping out of bounds, they call a violation. 
and you hit that mid-range shot, I was nothing but that was pretty. If you don't step out, man, that's two points. We still win by two if it played out the way it did. Right? Yeah. What's a better shot? The mid-range. Right? If you approach your shot like that every time, you're, 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 why, you're why, is huh? why is it a better shot? Why is it a better shot? High percentage. So the, the question becomes, what is a good percentage? 50%? What's that? 50% a good percentage? Uh, 50% is pretty good. For me. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is not to say him, but if you're a Steph Curry, if you're a him, you say, well, I shoot 45% from three. Mm -hmm. So that's a good shot. Yeah. So if, if you're Steph if Curry. Steph, if you're Steph Curry and you can shoot what? He probably shoots like high 40s. Okay, good. Right? So but the if, question, he shot, if he shot the mid ring shot, which is percentage? Probably 50, right? I, I mean, mean, probably 60s with step. Mid range? Come on, man. That's a layup for him. You might say that a three is a layup for him. It's a layup for him. I mean, it's like, it's like he can hit that shot blindfolded. Let, let me get down one. Back. And by, by the way, I, I'm not, I, there's, only, there's only one step. So yeah. not everyone there's can only one do. Micro, there's only one Michael Jordan. No, no. What I'm saying is that statue in a three, right? And me and me saying that's a really good shot for him. That's not to say that everyone that shoots a three is a good shot for Steph, particularly that guy. A three is a mid range jumper for him. He's that good. But think about if he with his shot selection and he took more intermediate shots. What's his, what's his field goal soon is going to be? A lot higher. Well, I also think that um, uh, Golden State does a great job of getting him open. He doesn't only shoot threes. Shoot threes make the highlights, but he gets to the basket. He shoots in mid-range. He does a lot of different things. Threes get the highlight on ESPN, but that offense is meant for him to like come off screens, do this, do that. But see, that's why he's a better offensive scorer in buckets than Kyrie, because Kyrie's got to have the ball in his hand. Absolutely. And so, just like Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant's got to have a... See, Kevin Durant is one of the most phenomenal players ever. But where's he lazy at? Where, where's, he, where's he lazy at? Kevin Durant. I'm not saying lazy. Where, where does he lose focus at? Defensive. Defensive in the corner. And then, also offensively, he settles. But when he's dialed in, he's one of the most proficient players, you know? And if you really wanted to, like, they had no business losing against Boston. Absolutely. I, I said the last thing, I know we're running out of time. Kyrie and, and Curry are a good comparison because uh, same size, same ever. Uh, Kevin Durant's a walking mismatch. Like, there's nobody that can guard him. And he doesn't know how to play off the ball. So it's a one on one every time he gets yeah, it. He took essentially. The words right yeah. Yeah. yeah I, just, I agree with you a thousand percent. He doesn't know how to play. He doesn't know how to move. He doesn't know how to get himself open. He's got to have the ball. Mm -hmm. So you got two ball stoppers. It's definitely, I mean, and, 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 and if you think it's really almost genius level because Steph has to run it that way because if he has the ball, he's getting knocked off the ball because of the size. Yeah. I will leave it at this, Coach, at the last one. Uh, as good as Steph is and as good as Kyrie is, see, Kyrie is so skilled that no one's going to contain him. However, Michael Jordan, 1998, averaged 32 points a game. Average time that he had the ball in his hands was four minutes a game. That is the mark of efficiency. Like, I don't have to have it, I don't have to have it and dribble five, ten times to get a shot off. Michael Jordan was like, he knew how to come off screen. He knew how to catch and go. He didn't have all these di five different moves. He had one and one counter. But he was a bad sight. But down like that, with, with what you shared and from that analytical data stat, like four minutes, efficiency, well, what do you do off the ball then? Is that why maybe he made first team all defense? Is that why he was one of the best ever defender on the ball in the history of the game? Is that why he can rebound like he did? Is that why he can, like, had a motor, but you know what? He, he got ran through the, the grinder and, and, and vice going against Detroit. So I will end with this. This is the last thing I'll say. Jordan versus Kyrie, we see the skill of Kyrie because he handles the ball so well. But I would say that Jordan was even more skilled because he did not need the ball that much to score more points than Kyrie. Yeah. I, I, I'll agree with you a thousand percent. What are three skills a player needs to have, do you think?
What are three skills? Yeah, that you think a player needs to have. Okay, it's a rhetorical question because now I'm going to come to the interview and you're interview and I'm going to ask you the same question. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I want you to use your basketball IQ. I'm a coach, but I need Manny Sauce, Shake and Bake, three point record breaking score in Mott's history as a junior, being a coach on the floor. So you're extension of Coach Rock. What do you think Coach Rocky Moore would share with you? What are the top three skills a player would need? After you played for me and me on Coach Earl's staff, let's get clarification, Adam Mott, from your experience, what do you think you learned from me? What I teach you the skills most important? Uh, I think you need to know how to move off the ball. And you need to have court awareness, like where you're on the court. And that's two, right? And the third one is a jump shot. Are you close? Say it again, what are the three again? Uh, moving off the ball. Core awareness and a jump shot. Absolutely. Number one, if you understand the importance of learning how to move off the ball, like perpetual motion, uh -huh. you got about 89% area that you can really improve on just moving off the ball. Because you like to stick it. You like stick. Stick. And people find you. If you learn how, but then again, we got to have an offense where you got stagger screen, screen, single, double screen, switch. We do a thumb on shoulders and everything, and we get, we get looks. And I don't have half the shooters that you, if I had a shooter like you, we're winning, we're winning championships. We're playing Utah. If I have a shooter like you, we're winning championships in my league. I'm not going to be on But that's, that's a story for another day. But I don't even have anybody come close to you like you. And the second one, the, the first one, if you understand what they give you and take what they give you, put your perpetual motion. Google Steve Alford, watch him. Rip Hamilton. Yeah. Larry Bird. All the great players that understand how to read and react, mm -hmm. they'll dissect you. Oh, you're going to give me this? Then I'm going to come out on time. I said, I'm going to come off that double pick. You know, when you pick up on me, I'm still going to nail it. I'm still knocking it down. Oh, really? That's pretty hurting. No, but, but I got to work hard to come off that to get over. What was your second one? Core awareness. Okay. How many times did you step on the sideline? How many times you got called stepping on the outside of that? Like almost a handful of times? Yeah. Right? Well, that's a handful of times. Let's say it's five times. It doesn't matter. What matters is that five times you don't even get a shot on goal. And awareness, awareness on the court is like in the flow of the game. Not all, even offensive, but defensive. Get a feel. When, I, when we taught and put you in ball line defensively, and you learn how to block out and scream, go get the rebound, go get the rebound. Right? Did you most of the time come up with a rebound? Huh? When I went for the rebound? When you went for the rebound. Oh, yeah. Okay. That was because of awareness. Your awareness of ball line, your awareness where the shot was taken from, your awareness where the ball direction after it hits the rim, where it's going to come on. Is that awareness? Yeah. Okay. Did, how many times were you in ball line when the ball was reversed and it was deflected and you were in proper ball line but you had awareness where the ball was going to come to? How many times did it fall in your lap? A few times. Because you're playing proper ball on defense. Is that, is that awareness? Yeah. You see the ball, ball, you man, right? You got the ball, you didn't know what to do after you found the top of the key, top of you, what to do with it because you weren't conditioned. You weren't trained. You weren't taught. How many more points you would have scored if you were taught how to take it? Boom. You could have taken all that step. Boom, fast break. One on one, stop, pop. Oh, do a hezzy. Boom. Doesn't close out any, go around and score. Do you know how to do that? No. You didn't have that skill. You have one of the two skills. Could you really come down, stop and pop, off the dribble and shoot the three? No, you're, you're catch, shoot, knock it down. Really? You gotta be able to catch, shoot, which that's your bread and butter, but that was your strength. Yeah. You got better defensively because your confidence grew because of your awareness. How much better were you defensively? And I'll give you a better example. How about when you set your butt down on a toilet seat and you did this when you were little in the IBA, you already did it, so you had muscle memory. All I had to do is like get you back to the muscle memory when you were with your dad in the IBA and Coach Q, right? Uh -huh. So when you're sitting down, ball line, what have you, 
down the end stretch of the game, did they go around your shoulder? Did they get by you? Because you didn't want to hear it from me on the bench, did you? And when you put your nose to the grindstone, got in a defensive stance, and stuck your chest, my right shoulder, your right shoulder, my left shoulder, left, and you were two, two, three times I saw the guy try to go baseline. Like, you took him all the way out of the baseline. You took him to the baseline. They ain't going nowhere, were you? Matter of fact, you might have got an easy charging foul a couple times because you're the right place, right time. You did it right. But where'd that come from? Your energy, your desire, your determination. Right? So when you did those things, Manny, your confidence like went off the roof. Because now you're becoming a complete player. You're rebounding. You're stopping ball, on ball defense, knocking shots down. What if you keep growing in all the other areas? Like fast break, get it. You get the rebound, go, dribble out. Take it to the rack. How does he do a crossover? Do a Ginobili. Do a Euro. Do a floater. Do a stop. Like come down and look at you and stick it in your face. And talk about it. And then try back. Right? And then when you do the right things, then they celebrate, then they get excited. Yeah. Huh? So, what was the third one? Jump shot. Okay. I have a lot of those skills that you just mentioned. Uh, how do I get my coach's trust? How do you gain the trust from your coach? Yeah. By being disciplined. Being disciplined. Executing. Hitting the game winner at Dana Hills. Execute to play like defensively and cut out the loose ball. You didn't have a problem jumping on the ball at the loose ball before, did you? Yeah, I went. Did you jump on the floor at the loose ball? I think I did a couple of times. Okay. Did you take a charge? No. Oh, I, I tried, but I got it. Yeah. But that's not good enough. See, there's a, there's a fine line there. This is how you gain your coach's trust. Mm -hmm. Well, I tried. Well, you didn't get to it. You didn't do it. Why am I going to give you trust if you can't execute that? You got to you earn trust by executing all phases of the game of basketball, and you gain trust by illustrating your confidence that I belong out here, and there's nobody on the floor better than me. You know, like Christian, he got upset when I said, "Oh, child, what's my the sophomore?" I'm sorry. Mark. Marco, right? He's one of the best ball ball defender players that we have in the program. Christian took that game. He is. He proved it time and time out. So in those areas, you have to become superior than everybody else. And that's how you get to trust. Well, you got, yeah, you got my trust. I mean, you can shoot the three. But I got to put you in position. I got to work harder to get you in position. Then I got three down. You can earn my trust by working harder off the ball and getting to those threes and making. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just like defensively, just rebounding, being one of the best rebounding defensive guards. Can you do that? Yeah. How hard is it to get two rebounds a quarter? Not hard. But it's challenging. Did you average eight rebounds a game this year? No. But you just told me it was not that hard. You do those things, you get in the trenches, you do both, you focus in the moment and you pay attention to the detail and you execute and you achieve. That's how you gain the trust of the coach. Right? Yeah. But see, I know this, and I use Dana Hills as a reference point, right? But I need more time. <laughs> Chris has come down, there's only one defender. Two defenders? I'd have to see it. There was two and one coming back. Huh? There was two. And he drove. He drove by one. He, he he was in the middle of one. He was in the middle, middle of one, right? Yeah, middle of both. Right. But how many times they stop us going to the basket? When we had to pedal to the metal and throttle full and going down, how many times they stop us going to the basket? There was a stretch there where we scored almost every time going downhill, didn't it? Right. Let's look at the video. Look, we can look at the video and we can count countless of times and take analytical data statistics and calculate and keep score. Right? I mean, you can replay the game over and over again, but the, it goes back to that second 
question. That, yeah, your awareness. You got to have awareness on that court. That separates teams like my awareness, even as a coach, put my team in a win-win position to win the state championship. My players like read and recognize. So, I hope that you know mm -hmm. answer that question for you. So, question is: How can a parent best support their hooper journey? Stay in a parent role. Stay in a parent role. Give their child unwavering support and loyalty and lift them up. Out of the way of the coach's decision. Good, bad, or ugly. Because in life, you get challenges. You're not going to get, every day's not going to work out the way you want it. So those are challenges. You learn life skills, how to overcome challenges and hardship and what have you. You know? And you got to be a parent that, you know, my parents didn't understand me. They just knew that it was a great opportunity for me to have a quality life. And they respected the coaches. I mean, they were heroes and role models and stellars in my life. So I had parents that supported me, whatever I wanted them to do. We need more parents involved with a child and their development at home environment and parents understand that you know what not everybody's going to get to start not everybody's going to get to play in time but if you put the work in and you invest in the work they're going to earn that play in time i'll give you a great example of three sets of parents i know a lot that i know and i have relationships your parents sean's parents Fin Fin's parents. They support you in the way parents should support you from my perspective and my personal opinion. Because all they want is the best interest of their son's development on all phases. Academically, athletically, character, and taking a young boy going into a fine young man. That's what I know about three sets of parents from my year past experience being an associate coach with her at a mile. Bringing my knowledge and experience. So I gravitate to those players. I mean, one of those few younger ones would have it because their parents just gave them that support. And I think parents, if they understand all the responsibility to go along with being a coach and deal with multiple personalities, what have you, um, then they'd understand the importance of a parenting role and stay in their boundaries. And you don't think about this if the parent, if they really want to coach, then go get your degree, go get your, earn your certificates, earn whatever it is to put you in that position. That's what's one of the biggest learning weaknesses or problems that we, with AU basketball parents who think they're coaches that have not worked with their craft. And not only that, teaching the game, but also what about the psychology of the game? What about the mental preparation? The emotional, I mean, it's, you know, when they go into school for that. I did. I got my education, my background in prepping for that, like a, a doctor doing an intern and, and doing a medical internship. You know, knowledge is power, but I got to know how to implement it. I didn't share it and execute it. So parents got a vital responsibility, a big time role in the development of the child. But it's really important for them to, you know. But then again, I have a strong opinion about it. Because I've seen parents get in, in a way or interfere with their child and impede their overall progress in life. Give you an example when. I had Quincy Stinson as a student athlete at Muir High School. His mom was a wonderful man. She said, just bring my child back home and shake his hand. And be a father for you. As a coach. And that's what I did. I kept my word when she kept hers. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so that's a wrap on this podcast. Thank you, Coach Brock. You're welcome. Sauce man. Thank you. For sharing your life experiences and your opinions.
I hope I didn't go winded. It was it was fun. I enjoyed it. You did a great job, son. Uh -huh. Now let's go win a few more games. <laughs>